You're listening to Conversations with Shonda, a podcast that unpacks the community's grittiest, most vexing problems, hosted by Shonda Smith-Baker. This episode is supported by the African American Leadership Forum. You know, my process is always, who do I have the most, you know, curiosity about in the moment? And so when Nancy introduced the idea of doing the live podcast, it just kept sitting on me. And I kept thinking about why would I find someone outside of this amazing room of women when there's so many, I feel like I could do an interview every single month based on what we're doing and how do I amplify? And she is our new leader as chair. And I thought, what an awesome opportunity and alignment to to host this conversation and be in the conversation with you. And so Conversations with Shonda started about four years ago um, when I was at the Minneapolis Foundation. And um, sometimes I laugh at, at this moment because um, the idea was is for me to be on stage in front of lots of people. And my response was, I'm not really interested in that, but I can do radio or I could do a podcast. How's that sound? And so now I feel like I'm on more stages. I feel like I did the opposite of what I was thinking in the moment, which just um, really shows you how uh, life's decisions and choices will lead you in places that you would have never discovered without a bit of a push. And so it has been um, really delightful um, doing this and an opportunity for me to continue to learn and to stay curious in the work. So our conversation today is going to be, like many of my conversations, which will be focused on um, Nancy, her life lessons, her career lessons, how she's used her platform for good, And we'll talk a little bit about technology, but really this is a journey of a leader that I want to just take you down. And so that's what we're going to do today. So Nancy, I know many of us uh, know you for sure, know you by name and know the role that you have with um, the the Minnesota Women's Economic Roundtable. But can you share, like, how do you introduce yourself? You did my bio, but how would you, how do you introduce yourself and what, what do you do? Oh, thanks. Uh, first of all, thanks thanks for having me. It's a little awkward, but I love it. Um, I, uh, well, when I introduce myself, I don't often say what I do. And the reason for that is I am not what I do necessarily. But, um, but in rooms like these, I often say I'm a founder and CEO of a technology consultancy based in Minneapolis called Clockwork. We also uh, have a, a smaller low-code, no-code agile studio called Tempo. And um, we build software to solve uh, gnarly problems for the enterprise. So it looks like a lot of things, but that's basically what we do. So I like the separation that you did between what you do and who you are. And um, I have often really been intentional about not identifying me by the title that I hold, um, but by the impact that I have. Why is that? Why do you separate those things? And why is that important for you to have those things separate in terms of your identity? Sure. Well, I think um, it's a man's world, and men have uh, sort of created the standards that we all follow, and they find, I'm not generalizing, but I am, Um, they find their value um, in the world through their position. Um, And and so I think we all just sort of fell in step. Um, I don't. I'm not curing cancer. I'm not changing the world through technology. I'm making it easier for some people to get something done, Um, but I don't even do that. It's the people that I work with. Um, So uh, for me, um, I I want to live my life with purpose, and, you know, some people call themselves multi-hyphenates, or they have a portfolio career. I'm just Nancy. Just Nancy. Nancy with the kid who takes big risk. Um, And so, you know, many of us are juggling competing priorities. And, you know, I I was on social media last night and noticed that there was an injury. Um, She has a child that skis and does amazing tricks. I went down a rabbit hole on his Instagram last night. Um, But, you know, many of us are are doing so many things and have uh, competing priorities, including taking care of others. How do you manage that, especially with this, this child of yours? <laughs> <laughs> 
Well, I only have one, so I have no excuse. <laughs> but um, so my son, my son came to us through adoption. And um, the process was long and arduous and uh, unfair. There was discriminatory practices that occurred in that, in that process, which we won't go into, but call me. Um, and uh, I remember us making a conscious decision to, um, to not have more children um, because we had the energy for him after that process. Do you know what I mean? It was like, how can we be fair? Because it's taken, it took us 13 years. Um, and we were turned away from uh, uh, agencies. I had an agency here in town say, we will not collude with you to get you a baby. Um, let's, be let's be queer. I was gonna say clear, but it's, it came out queer. And that's, that's the secret. Um, uh, my spouse and I are a same gender couple, and it, it's not easy still for same gender folks, um, same gender families to adopt. Um, so I, I think I just made a promise to myself a long time ago. I would never apologize for who I was. I would never pick work over him. Um, and I would prioritize that human for the rest of my life. So that's it. And it was because of the journey to get there. Also, we adopted transracially, which um, I had no idea how uh, unqualified I would be to raise a young person, a, a black man um, in today's culture um, in any in any time but uh, so being fully present for it was a promise I had to make myself and him yeah Nancy when did you realize that you were unqualified that's your language I, I see how you are with him but when did you realize you were unqualified which then leads me to believe that you have done things to have deeper understanding but when did that awareness come when he was a baby and people would touch him um, when, uh, uh, I remember like it was yesterday, the first time he was a toddler and he was in the, um, grocery cart as they're wont to do. And we were in a Byerly's and a woman came up and literally grabbed a fistful of his hair and said, these curls are beautiful. And, um, I do have a, professional presence. You probably don't know this about me, but that presence did not show up that day. <laughs> um, I, I, it almost got physical. And um, because I, I couldn't believe that without asking, without, and it suddenly brought to light the things I had heard about, but had no real experience with about the difference for black folks in, in the world, just being looked at or, you know, my child became an object for other people. And it was a, a very quick lesson for me in the world. And I'm going to ask you questions, but I'm not sure what to do here. Yeah, so I have way too many for okay. you to interrupt right now. Okay, but, okay, um, okay. <laughs> okay. So, it's your podcast. Yeah, so, so what I guess I'm thinking is once you have that awareness, how did that awareness show up for you in the workplace? Mm. Yeah, I think that is when I decided... Um, you know, I think there was a movement among a lot of workplaces after the murder of George Floyd. Um, I think uh, we started to, real I started to realize that um, we weren't curing cancer, as I mentioned earlier. I could continue to sort of build my business or I could recognize that I had an opportunity to use my business as a platform for bigger messages, um, which... I did sort of intentionally. But first I had to begin my own anti-racism journey. I had to recognize how I was conditioned to see the world and operate within it. And I had to start the work. I don't know that I'll ever be done with the work. I don't know that I'll ever be better, but I try to be a little bit better every single day. Um, so it was, you know, I mean, when, when people ask, what does the work look like? It's therapy, it's workshops, it's books, it's people, it's being in community, it's being intentional about who he has in his life, about the role models that he has. It's, it's uh, I mean, he's already, you know, he's already got two strikes against him, right? He's got two moms and he's black. 
And for him to be able to walk through the world confident and secure in his identity is my number one reason for living. Um, and, and so my journey would influence his, and it had to be intentional and conscious. Um, so that's, that's what we did. And I had to take my partner along for it. And that was fascinating. <laughs> As we all know, parenting is hard without all of those additional uh, challenges. And all I can say is he's pretty darn lucky. Thank you. Um, he's pretty darn lucky. I was up early listening um, to your book that you narrated, which I super loved. Um, uh, work like a boss. And there were a few things that stood out for me in that book. One of the statements that you made was, if we don't shift how we think about work, we will be obsolete. Mm -hmm. Did you mean that? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's interesting too, because the conversations around AI are so fascinating, but I think, you know, we're, we're having all these conversations about the future of work. And we focus so much on where and not how. And I think suddenly people are talking a lot about valuing people. I've been talking about a people first business strategy since my career started. And now people are having those conversations and it's almost like marketing speak. We're not really attached to what it actually means. And it means recognize, you know, when you think about design thinking, design thinking recognizes the needs, the wants, and the limitations of users in the context of interfacing with a product. Well, let's just apply that to work. What are the needs, what are the wants, what are the limitations of humans in the context of work, and how can we be fully considerate of those things in designing how we need to be with each other? So how we are to be with each other feels like it's becoming more challenging, mm -hmm. right? Um, we are talking every day, to your point, about diversity, inclusion, equity, and now there's belonging in that. And there's so many people that don't belong. Um, and they're going through day-to-day -day work, really suffering through expectations that were never meant for them. I know that you know what that means, but what are your thoughts about how, uh, you know, us in the room, those listening that are leading people, how should we be thinking about those words beyond sort of the energy of today? Mm -hmm. But what does it really mean to, to create a space of belonging? So I'm going to answer your question, but then I want, I want to hear you answer that question because I'm really curious about your perspective. Um, so I think leaders have to recognize how their own um, predisposition, their own biases, their own comfort play into their expectations of other people. Um, you know, I've actually started on my next book, and you heard it here first, and, I, and it's all about escaping the cult of conformity. And I believe that conformity is um, the biggest problem that exists in the workplace. I mean, it's the reason we need belonging. It's the reason we need DEI. I think workplaces are largely homogenized. Um, I'm great with you. I mean, I just wrote a piece not too long ago about executive presence. You know, I have been in so many meetings where we've talked about the executive presence of another person. And what we're really saying is, are they showing up in a way that I believe is valid? that I believe is valuable. Are they speaking? Now, if, if, if that were the measure by which we determine whether or not someone is worthy of success, I would not be in conversation with you right now because I am, I am always sort of the rough rock in the corner, right? Like always sort of the, did she really say that? Yes, yes, she did because someone must, right? Um, and sometimes I'm wildly quiet because I won't say, I won't speak just to be, included in the notes, right? I, I want to be thoughtful and intentional. Um, 
So I think conformity is the problem with, I think the corporate slash executive expectations that we have of the workplace is stifling creativity and innovation and opportunity. I think we believe, you know, I, I, I think leadership has this expectation of how people should earn their place. Um, and, and everybody's expectations are different. Um, and, you know, I, I, when I first had the opportunity to join MWER, I did not want to. I did not want to because rooms full of women are the biggest terrorizing, you know, uh, thing I can, I can think of. And listen, I doubt I'm alone. I doubt I'm alone. You may not raise your hands because you're surrounded by them. <laughs> and I'm up here. But I don't imagine I'm the only person who thought, dear God, a room full of women. Right? See, yes. Um, so, and, and it's just another space where conformity is, is, is rules, right? Um, where you have to wear the outfit, where you have to have the shoes, where you have to speak MBA in order to fit in. And those are environments that I don't appreciate. Um, and so I thought, well, I could stay out or I could come in and shake stuff up a little. Um, and here I am. Thank you. <laughs> now, in, in, in your mind, what, you know, I wonder as a, as a newish entrepreneur um, who came from that space, um, what about the idea of belonging compelled you to create your own entity? Mm. Um, this is what I would have to say, that um, I have spent my 25 plus year, and it's going to stay 25 plus for probably 10 more years, but my 25 plus year in two places, one of deep belonging and another of they don't believe I belong here. And those things were happening at the same time always. I grew up in North Minneapolis, and it is one of the neighborhoods most talked about through a lens of disparity. And I heard that as a child. But my life was good and happy and safe, right? My dad worked at General Mills. My mom stayed at home with us. Our neighbors went to church with us. They cared for me. Um, my, my neighbor across the street, Sulin and Paul, they opened up the King and I. And it was, a, it was an, a beautiful experience, but outside of it, I was being determined by people outside of it on what my potential was. And that was really informing. I've been in workspaces where, I think there was a, a talk I gave not long ago where I said, um, I'm learning how to experience uh, things at the same time, joy and pain. But one of the things I said is having, feeling powerful and powerless at the same time. That um, it is something that I'm acutely aware of um, in terms of how I need to show up because of all of the things that you said. And um, because of the stage that I have in the, po in the podcast and the way that I've been in community, I am a vessel that has, a, a, I'm a container of the hurt stories of many women of color navigating workspaces in our city and beyond. And that's harsh. And I think that harshness has led me to look for where I'm at in my most liberated self, right? Not just that experience, but what does it take for me to examine all sides of my leadership, all sides of my uh, womanhood, all sides of my creativity. And so it was a convergence of a number of things. But yeah, that is a reality that, that I've navigated, for sure. I have another question for you that I did not write down, okay. but that I'm going to just throw out. Um, I think when organizations think about DEI, when they think about hiring outside consultants, when they think about um, uh, you know, engaging their workforce in learning, um, they are not thinking about themselves. They're thinking about the workforce. 
And I don't know that conversations about belonging actually happen in meaningful ways at the sea level of organizations or in rooms like this full of accomplished leaders. And I'm really curious um, from your experience, what can organizations like MWER, what can women like the highly accomplished women in this room do to achieve actual allyship in this community? Like what, what can we do to create that feeling of belonging? So that's big, but one of the <laughs> that that's a whole big thing. But um, one of the one of the places that um, I have chosen to focus is in governance. The governing boards have a lot of opportunity to have m metrics and data points around workforce, around culture. And I don't know if the governance practices are keeping up with what organizations are stating that they're trying to accomplish. So I think it's that. I think you've raised the other issues around uh, conformity. And, you know, I, I was listening to something, right? If you are diversifying, what are you diversifying from? Right? You're diversifying from something to make room for me. And that within itself can be a challenge. And so part of it is, um, and I'll, I'm going to try and articulate this, but it's the fear that you talked about in your book that um, when we're afraid of something, we start to sort of either we go back to what we're used to or we start to overcompensate in ways that makes not a lot of sense, right? And I think that happens with diversity, equity, and inclusion. And I think part of what it is is just being in relationship with people. Right, just getting to know people. You got to know your child, you saw his experience, and so therefore you were able to see those experiences in other people differently. And um, I think that's what we have to do, and we have to own it, and we have to understand, because the workforce is actually talking to you. It's whether or not you're listening. They're talking to you in turnover, they're talking to you in feedback surveys, they're, they're talking all the time. It's whether or not we want to actively listen and what does listening do? Because it brings up issues like fear and shame. Um, and, you know, we have a political climate that we're in. And so those are the things that come up. And in the last week, I've taken a page out of Sina Hodge's book um, and started to use the words brave spaces instead of safe spaces. Um, and how do we create brave spaces in a room like this one to have the converse, to create that sense of belonging, but also to have the conversations that we need to have mm -hmm. in order to lift each other up. So yeah, so let's talk about that. Um, so one is that you can't break, be brave in a space like this if you can't be brave at home, mm. if you can't be brave in a community that you already feel comfortable with. And part of where that comes from, um, I was reminded of in your book. And so in the conversations I've been having, particularly with women, there are things that we grow up understanding as rules, mm. right? Whoever's in, whoever makes the rules is in charge. You don't go to school to make friends. You go there to learn, right? Like you, we get all of these messages as we're growing up on how to conform and who's in charge and who is not. Mm -hmm. So can you talk about what you wrote about this, please? Sure, sure. I, I mean, I think, you know, as an employer, it's always intriguing to me how um, we hire young people right out of college, and we're like, now go, go on, do it. Um, and yet, up until that point, the messages they heard were, there's only A's, you have to be good at everything, and get A's at in everything. I mean, still, that's the way, right? And in the meantime, shut up, get in line, wait your turn, right? Be quiet, behave, behave. That word behave. I mean, as parents, one of the one of the things that I'm most grateful for 
is the opportunity to know my child and give him room to be exactly who he is. In fact, we, I was just talking to Sharon about the ski accident he had. Um, he was supposed to go to, uh, he, he did a, a History Day performance, and he advanced to the regionals. And then he got, and it was Monday. And on Sunday, he got into a ski accident, and he had to miss the regionals. And in that moment, the only person who cared about the regionals was me. And I was real upset. I was like, well, go. We'll put an ice pack on your face, and you can walk with a cane, and you'll be fine. You're using this on your college essay. Go. And I realized that it wasn't about him, right? In that moment, nothing that was coming out of my mouth was about him. And I believe that our education system is flawed. I believe that the expectation we have of young people in the world is flawed. I believe the expectations we have of each other are wildly flawed, and it's because we establish sort of from birth, you are not in charge, you do not have a voice, you do not get an opinion, and if you don't figure it out, you may never, right? And I mean, I, I my, Mother was a, a physician. I talk about her a lot. She was a huge role model for me because she went to medical school in 1957. And um, she was one of 13 women who graduated in her graduating class. And one of them actually um, was, uh, the pressure was so intense that she decided to end her life. So it's a fascinating story when, when you hear about it. But she believed that education, formal education, was the only way, she was a, you know, a, a, a farmer's daughter who lived in Lorain, Ohio, and had nothing. Was the first person to go to college, first person to go to uh, graduate school. And um, really believed that education was everything, and really learned how to play by the rules but was not a rule follower. Then she raised me, I wasn't a rule follower, and if I loved a class, I got an A in it. If the teacher was not engaged, I was like, well, I'm actually gonna go to a coffee shop and read a real book, right? Like, I was not into it. And, um, and talking to my child and talking to young people and telling them that grades are not actually an indicator of future success is considered a rebellious move. And yet it's the truth. We want people to think outside of the syllabus, syllabus right? We want young people to think about um, you know, ideas that haven't even been considered by this teacher who just wants the pension. We want people to push back on the rules. Um, those are the people that are going to move us into the future of work. But we really have a hard time giving folks permission to show up that way. Yeah, I, two things that come to mind. One is that um, one of the common narratives are saying is that education is a great equalizer. But if you look into the workforce, black women in particular, are usually the highest educated in workspace, and it has not created more equal space. Mm. So I grew up sort of with that. I also grew up with, um, you gotta work twice as hard to go half as far. And so I was in a conversation, and what did that mean? What did that say to me? It meant I could go, I have to work twice as hard to never catch up. And it was one of my guests that said, our ancestors meant for it to be drive, to, to, to instill drive in us. But think about those messages and the, and the business of, of unlearning, rethinking, or disrupting the narratives that prevent us from being our full selves. And um, that's what I think all of us have to do to create more space and belonging, is thus to live into ourselves more deeply and to unlearn and disrupt some of the things that have prevented that. One of those other things is um, how we relate to conflict. And so sometimes what is unknowing, it feels like it's conflicting, right? You're, you're feeling conflicting, and the fear of that will keep you and hold you back. And so you talk about conflict, um, and, and so how do you approach conflict um, in the workplace? Because I think it's part of the, the creative process. So I tend to lean into it a little bit, but that's not everyone's norm. And so how do you see conflict? Well, and I also just want to go out on a limb here and say, I believe that the way I see conflict and the way I address it would be that much harder for black women, right? Because of the um, sort of stereotypes that a lot of folks 
subscribe to. Um, but I think conflict shows up in a variety of ways. First of all, we all live in Minnesota, so we know how great we are at conflict. Um, I grew up with two parents from the East Coast. We just dealt very directly with things. It was not something that we couched in any way. But conflict shows up, uh, you know, people are afraid of, you know, what other people think. They're afraid of giving feedback. I mean, I think it's fascinating that, um, that feedback is so difficult, you know, to receive. Like, you can't give it in any sort of honest way if you can't receive it in an honest and authentic way, and an open way. Um, and there's something hierarchical in there, too, right? Like, I'll receive feedback from you because we are on a level playing field. But I'm not really interested in hearing it from the folks that work, let's be honest, for me, right? Um, I think feedback, I think those honest conversations are what make us better. And I also think that if we wouldn't dance around issues, we could deal with them faster and move forward. And we have such a hard time being truthful about things that are hard. And yet that's what we're being challenged to be right now is truthful about hard things. I remember hearing uh, someone talk about niceness and nice being the enemy of justice. Mm. And um, I appreciate that framework because um, nice can be mean, <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. um, that it could actually just uh, erase someone's experience, erasure, mm -hmm. right? Or minimizing someone's experience. And so a piece of it is about delivery. Mm -hmm. And I know both of us are pretty much straight shooters. So what have you learned about shooting straight in the workplace? <laughs> <laughs> well, speaking of executive presence, um, I learned, I had I got a great piece of advice that I actually wrote about in, in that book um, from a mentor years ago because I tend to bulldoze my way into a difficult conversation. Like, we're going to deal with this now because I'm a fixer, right? And not everybody wants a fixer. Um, and not everybody shows up for the conversation. The second it becomes tense, they check out often. Um, and I had a mentor tell me um, that, and I, I've used this, um, a, a disarming mechanism in those sorts of discussions is asking for help. And so I've learned to approach most difficult conversations by saying, I want to do this with you. I need your, I can't do this alone. I need your help. Or how do you see? And it has changed everything because instead of me coming with criticism for someone, it's me asking for help and collaboration around solving an issue that we can both recognize if we give ourselves the space to get there. Do you think that you have that approach because you're in a creative industry? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I also have that approach because I'm nothing without my collaborators. You know, I, I don't believe that I have done anything that remarkable. I believe that what I've managed to accomplish in my life is by surrounding myself, you know, is through surrounding myself by brilliant with brilliant humans. And I'm, I'm fortunate in that regard. We all are. We all are, every single one of us, you know. Um, and our, uh, our workforce consists of our peers now, right? Like we subscribe to hierarchical ways of thinking and being because that's the way it's always been. But if we're doing our jobs, we're hiring better than us. And those people are smarter and more capable and more nimble and more interesting and more creative. And so the opportunity then is to truly collaborate with them and subscribe less to the org chart and more to the opportunity. Amen to that. So we are sitting in um, Women's History Month, and you described your fear of coming into a room full of women. Mm -hmm. So I thought I might ask, <laughs> what were you afraid of? Mm -hmm. And then the second part would be, for women, what are things that you would recommend for supporting other women. So what were you afraid of? And then what advice do you have about supporting other women? Um, so the things that I always fear are just not fitting in. 
to say, you know, I mean, um, I listen, I was listening to an audio book this morning on my way to a meeting and they were talking about all the gay folks that have existed in history. And it was this long list and the entire list was men, Aristotle and Alexander the Great and Michelangelo and all, you know, and then it was Gertrude Stein, like literally the only lesbian anybody ever wrote about in history. Um, and, uh, and, and then Martina Navratilova was another one, <laughs> which I was, so there were two. In case you're curious, there were two. But all of the greatest minds in history were gay men, apparently. Um, but I was struck by that because when you think about where you don't fit in, I've never said the right things. I've never worn the right things. I've never been a delicate flower. I've never been one to avoid conflict. And rooms of women remind me of all the things that I am not. And I, and listen, in mixed company, you will hear women say that women are the hardest on each other. You will hear, now we may not, I, I appreciate your nodding. We may not say that today, but I think most women feel that that's true. And I am so wildly aware of it that rooms of women in clubs with mahogany walls um, make me uncomfortable. Um, but I also know that um, there's power here and the power is exponentially more um, interesting when we are in relationship with each other. And so I had to get past my own stuff. But I think it's interesting that once you hit a certain point in your career, once you have a certain title or you've accomplished something, we're not supposed to be afraid anymore. And you sure can't talk about it. You sure can't, you know, it's like, and I don't know how to exist any other way. So, um, so that segues nicely into the second part of your question, which is sometimes I say the reason that I speak in public or I show up in spaces or whatever is so that other people can see a total nerd having some fun and being okay in these rooms that maybe wouldn't feel okay otherwise. You know, I, I often say, like, I can't lose a bunch of weight because who will be the patron saint of chubby business ladies? <laughs> You know, like that's my goal. I want women to see it, that it doesn't matter what size you are, what your ethnicity is, whether you're gay or straight, like there's opportunity for all of our big brains. And so part of it is just in conscious representation and invitation, right? I am not here to be alone. Um, but also it's in showing up with that voice because I think the other thing that women do really well is, oh, I just couldn't, I, I couldn't. I I don't, oh no, I didn't do anything. Oh, I'm just, oh, come on, come on. What was I saying to Miguel earlier? I've started this happy hour thing that I'm doing. You're all invited. And I want it to be a men's club where we ask for what we want, where we unapologetically amplify one another's accomplishments, where we do deals with each other. Women are too contained to do those things. That's why it's still a man's world. And I mean, I hate to say it, but I told you about my mother. She was talking about the stuff. My, when I was little, when I was a little girl, she would tell me how to talk to men. She would tell me, if you want to win an argument with a man, don't raise your voice. She would say, lean in, speak in low tones. It scares them. <laughs> she was right, right? Like, do not yell because you're, you're invisible. The second you start to raise your voice, you're gone. Um, and some of the things that she taught me as a little girl 50 years ago have not changed have not changed and in some ways have gotten worse. So I sort of feel like it's my job to show up to make sure that the people on the margins are invited too, because most of us want to invite the people that remind us of ourselves or we're comfortable with. And there's a lot of really big brains in the margins that we are missing out on. Agreed, agreed. There's a book that I've read um, and referred to a lot. It's called 33 Strategies of War. And in one of the, the chapters, it talks about how we're raised um, to to not understand that in work, it will be hard. Like one of the rules that we hear is life is not fair. We hear that. But we don't say, you know, you're going to go into this workspace and there's going to be conflict 
and there's going to be these things. And here's the tools you need to navigate that space. We find it and we get surprised by it and then we don't know what to do with it. And I think some of that feeds into belonging and also where we belong. And I think it was I'm glad I asked you that question because it's not so much about what your experience when you got in this space but it was about what your own sense of belonging, your own sense of I'm not like the others, which is in fact a positive thing. And so being able to move that to, to positivity in our own heads um, is, is quite important. Mm -hmm. yeah. I have a question for you. So you talked about me as a mother. Um, you have five... <laughs> Samara, I said I only had one. Don't even ask me that question. I'm not deserving. You have five. Um, how do you impart those tools on your children? How have you? And let's acknowledge um, you also have one rock star who's sort of making headlines right now. Um, I'm assuming, did you raise your children in North as well with the same values and the same safety that you experienced. Can you speak to how you prepared them to be fully themselves in the world? And take some credit for that, Malik. Just take it. <laughs> yeah, I take credit for it from Malik, who is the executive director at V3 um, Sports in North Minneapolis. But I take credit for all of them. He's just out loud, and the rest of them are pretty damn awesome, too. Um, but what I would say is that I think that from my own um, place of feeling like the other, that it was important for me to have them in spaces where they found comfort and belonging. And that was always my deal. When I ran for school board in, in 2010, I remember being in this house and someone asked me about what did I feel about integrated schools? And someone who was working on my campaign said, I know how you feel. I don't think you should say it here. And I said, I'm going to say it here, which was my kids started out, um, my older kids started out in an all black school, Harvest Prep. And um, the reason I did it is because I wanted them to have a strong sense of self, that when your self identity is strong, you can withstand more because your foundation is solid. And I believe that from an early age and that then they could, you know, integrate in different ways. Now, my daughter started out at a different school, and I pulled her out of it because she came home in kindergarten questioning her hair, her dress. Um, I remember she came home and said, the kids at school said I'm being bused from the ghetto. What is a ghetto? And I'm like, oh, she's got to leave that place. And so part of it was trusting their experiences and understanding that they weren't the same and they weren't me. And, and some of it was just out of straight grit of being a parent and being single for some of those years with three of them. And um, there's only one of me, there's three of you, which means there's four of us to take care of all the things that need to happen, <laughs> right? Um, that I am not here to just do all the things you need. Um, you have to have your own agency. I have to get up myself and I have to wake up myself and I'm not a morning person. I need to, I need to do my own thing in the morning, which means you need to get up. Right. I have my own homework because I was in school with them. Right. Getting my college degree when I had them. I have my own homework, which means you need to figure out your homework. And we would sit and we would do it. But part of it was raising them to understand who they were, whose they were. Right. With the network of people around them that if I was not able to be the person that they needed to talk to, they had someone to talk to. And um, I'm really very proud of that. And when I think about transition, um, I transitioned into um, starting my business. And my last day of formal work in, the, in that place was on my 18-year-old's birthday. And so it felt very symbolic to me um, as he was launching. I was relaunching into a life that looked very different now that they're, they're growing up. So I have one last question, um, which may be long, because we've talked all about all the things except for your job and what you do and your business. And um, I just want to ask you, because you've talked about this male dominance um, in, in world and how things are, st are structured, and then you choose to go into tech, 
<laughs> um, which I imagine you've been a, a lots of first and onlys or the fews in the rooms. And so what led you down that journey? And, and what would you say to encourage other women into that space? Um, I wasn't led in that journey. I fell into it. Um, techno it's interesting because I thought I was going to be an actor. But acting, um, and particularly, specifically a comedic actor. I thought I was going to be a comic, which thrilled my parents, um, as you can imagine. Um, yeah, and uh, so there was no value in that from where uh, my family sat. Um, so I studied film, um, also not thrilled, right? Um, and I studied film, and what I realized as I was uh, coming out of college was there were no women directors, there were no women shooters, there were no women. Um, and my, I, I was working for a, a, a communications um, agency in town, and I remember the, the owner, who was also the director of these uh, industrial marketing videos, whatever, um, he hired a gentleman with less experience than me after me, and that guy was always, you know, on the shoots. He was acting like John, he was Johnny, where I was going to pick up the dry cleaning, pick this guy's children up from um, daycare, um, run and fill up his car, um, get him coffee. I had to be on site at 5 a.m. to um, set props. My life was awful, and I thought, oh, my God, this is my future. This is where I'm going to be. And that's when the internet was starting to pop up. That's how old I am. I was six and a half, seven years old, a bit of a savant. Um, but uh, I, I saw the internet starting to pop up and I thought, oh, there's nobody here, right? There's nobody. And so I taught myself how to code. And at that time, I was coding in Perl, which nobody even talks about anymore, um, which was ancient. Um, but uh, it, it helped, right? right? There you go. Yeah, that's why we're friends. That's why we're friends. I used a book. It was, it was seriously a book. I was like, OK. And then I don't have the patience for it. Um, but I decided I was going to try and do something in the internet world. I actually have a great little story where I um, reached out to, I made a list of 25 companies that were starting to do uh, internet technology. And I wrote them notes. And um, and I said, I, I think I could add value to where you're at. And I sent him my resume, which was not impressive. And um, the gentleman that I still work with today, I wrote a letter to, and they didn't respond. And I wrote him another letter. This was in the 90s, mind you. It was before life was as serious as it is now. And I said, I've, I've written you a letter. I think I can add value to the work that you do. If you do not respond to me, I will stalk you. And I heard back from them in 10 minutes. And that is what started my career in, in technology. And I got to work in a place that was really hands-on. So, um, and then built, you know, now we're on three technology companies. So. That's so awesome. <laughs> if you did that now, you'd get arrested. I know, I know. <laughs> I know, I know. I would include someone else's picture. <laughs> right. Um, I'm wondering if there's any questions um, from the audience. Thank you. Uh, this, has been, this has been a delightful experience, um, and it feels like a real gift to be able to hear the two of you. Nancy, I'm curious to know um, what has fueled your continuous courage? You know, because... We've talked about all the ways that you have bucked the system and um, avoided falling into the trap of conformity, but I know that's got to be exhausting at times. Or maybe, let me not project. I know that, that I have experienced that as exhausting, and I want to know, number one, does that feel exhausting to you? Is it just you being you? And um, what is fueling your continuous kind of leaning into courage? Mm, I appreciate the question. Um, <clears throat> I think, uh, yes, yes, it is exhausting. I'm an introvert, so I have, uh, and most people don't believe me when I say it, because um, I'm not afraid of people. I just uh, need to refuel from them. And um, so I spend, a, I spend a lot of time alone in contemplation and reflection, you know, reading and what have you. Um, uh, I keep doing it because I don't have a choice. Right, like this is ex this is who I am. So I can try to be what other people are comfortable with, or I can be exactly who I am. Um, and as I get older, I'm easier. I'm I'm easier for other people to stomach. <laughs> they're they're not as you know. I'm not as threatening or as large um, because 
I have um, conformed to some degree. But I keep trying. I keep trying. So I'm an introvert, too. Um, and so I would just ask for your advice when you're in these mahogany rooms um, and you're meeting these intimidating women, especially early on in whatever you know journey you're on, how do you find your people or how do you make the people who aren't maybe your people uh, more comfortable with your existence? Um, I appreciate that question too. Um, I don't know that I did it very well at first. And part of it was, you know, I, 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 I said earlier that there aren't a lot of, you know, we don't talk about a lot of gay women. There's like three of them in Minnesota, right? One of them runs Lando Lakes, right? Like, we all know each other. We're all in the same club. Um, so that feeling of being an outsider prevented me from being fully myself. I, I sometimes tell people that when I decided to just come out and live a congruent life, not necessarily, you know, like I've always been sort of authentic, but just congruent. Like I am who I am by day, by night. This is who I am. Right. Um, that's when I felt successful. Um, so I do think just being authentically who you are. Right. But also I think every relationship I have knows what I Need. So when I say I cannot go to that, it's not because I don't love you. It's because I have to crawl under a bed and be silent, right? I just need to be in the dark and silent. And I think um, uh, learning self-care was super important, super important. So I think taking care of yourself and being totally who you are. The other thing that I tell people, especially young women, they, young women say to me all the time, how can you be so confident? And I'm sure many of you hear that, right? Miguel, I know you hear that. How are you always so confident? You must hear it. And I always say competence, yeah. right? It's like, it's not some secret. I know what I'm doing. Um, even when I look like I'm fumbling all over the place. So I think just knowing, you know, like my work is everything to me. And, um, and being confident in what I know brings that out everywhere. Nancy, have you started your men's club? And if so, tell us more. I mean, yes, we've had a couple of meetings. Um, you know, I've been joking about calling it a men's club. That's kind of what I wanted from me. Um, in terms of how we operate with each other. So if you're interested in taking part of our humans club, um, let me know. I'll put you on the list. Nice. A humans club. <laughs> I love it. I love it. So um, any other questions? We have time for one more if there's one in the room. I just want to thank you both. It was encouraging and uplifting and reaffirming. But I have a question related to, Nancy, you mentioned allyship earlier. Ooh, it's a pet peeve word for me. Let me just set you up before I get into the English major, law professor. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> but I'm just wondering, allyship tends to be situational person to person. When do we make the evolution to become abolitionists, where we change the very systems that require allyship? What are some of the initial steps? What should we be thinking about related to that? Because I think that's the next phase as we talk about belonging. It's not just that I'm nice to you. Minnesotans, we got a PhD in that. But how do we transform the systems where it's not required for me to say, well, I'll, I'll just be nice to you and give you this deal. What's the next steps on transforming systems? Well, I think I, I appreciate that question because um, I, I think you start with reading Cena's book because it's not allyship, right? Like um, it's accompliceship. It's, accom it's being an accomplice. It's being vocal and active. It's, you know, we just had this conversation last week where I think if I took one thing from that book, it's, a, it's exactly what you're asking. It's, it's not about us being in space together and me being nice. It's about, it's an action. It's taking action. It's speaking up in the moments and not, you know, I am very well aware that we are in a moment in history that I think is way, we put a lot of weight on the black folks in our community to help us move through. And um, we can't, 
We have to teach each other. We have to prompt each other. We have to encourage each other. And right now, we're also in this weird moment in time, and let me just acknowledge it, where people are like, DEI, I'm not going to pay for it anymore. It's pointless. This woke talk is ridiculous. If we don't get our proverbial you-know-what together, that's also going to impact the future of work. And I just know that I'm better when I am surrounded by minds that are not that that don't share the experience that of don't share my experiences that push me to think bigger and differently that encourage me that inspire me i mean shonda i had to say to her the other day i think i said this to you Cena, too so now you know you're not special neither one of you is special <laughs> i said to both of you in recent weeks can we be friends can, like, we've gone to social things, but I'm like, I want to be your friend. But in asking for that, I've also had to sort of acknowledge, and now it's my job to gain your trust and then to keep it. And I think, um, you know, from white women, to, from one white woman to many others, um, white women are not great in allyship. We aren't. And, the, and as leaders, when we're talking about defunding things like DEI, that's, you know, that's the first opportunity we have to put our money where our mouths are, our values are. And so I appreciate having this conversation in this room because I think it's so important. And so I guess for me, I can't, I think the systems must be addressed and I think that's incremental, but I think the first thing we have to do is recognize the action required from being an accomplice, like what that actually looks like. And sometimes it's uncomfortable and it's hard and it could be career threatening and that's okay, especially for people in this room. Um, as we think about what does it mean to have uh, someone so clearly brilliant feel like an other in the experience that was shared, that when we think about who belongs and who doesn't, we don't often think about you, Nancy, in the way that you're showing up in life and in the world. And, and if you feel that way, just imagine folks that have been more marginalized in what is happening and um, the way that things are are the way things have been. And so part of it is just recognizing it. I don't think that we actually understand how entrenched our systems are because they work for so many people. And it's easy to ignore who it doesn't work for. And I think some of it is just increasing awareness. So I appreciate, um, Nancy, the deliberate way in which you are moving. And um, one, recognizing and acknowledging the experiences of others because you relate to it through your experience. Even though it's not the same, you can relate to it. And I think that um, you giving yourself permission to reach out, to provide invitation, to be in relationship will just make you that stronger of a leader. So I thank you. I thank you for the work. Thank you for being an entrepreneur. Thank you for supporting so many of us. And um, as we close um, this live podcast that we are having at the Minneapolis Club with the Minnesota Women's Economic Roundtable and its members, um, and you are the chair, we, we thank you. Part of the belonging question you have is now up to you, my dear, <laughs> since you are leading us. Um, but if, they, if, if listeners and people in the room wanted to just find out a little bit more about Clockwork or you, where would they go? Clockwork.com, NancyLyons.com, MadeByTempo.com, and then all the socials at Nylons. It's a long story. I'll tell you later. Awesome. Thank you so much. Thank you for being here. To explore more insightful conversations and stay updated on Shonda Smith-Baker's work, visit our new website at smithbaker.co.